Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Irini, and I help direct events here at The Strand. For a little bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Foco gradually... <laughs> Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. Under Nancy, The Strand has not only surviving in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold 18 miles of used, new, and rare books and now hosts nearly 400 events a year. In large part, this is thanks to all of you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, I'm excited to welcome writer Matt Bloom. Matt is an anti-money laundering investigator who lives in New York City. His three previous novels are Blue Paradise, A Death in the Hamptons, and The Last Romantics. He's also written two children's books, Hello, My Name is Bunny, and Hello, My Name is Bunny, London. Joining Matt is Richard Wise. Richard is the author of three books, Secrets of the Gem Trade, The Connoisseur's Guide to Precious Gemstones, The French Blue, which was the winner of the 2011 International Book Award in Historical Fiction, and finally Redline, a mystery thriller which was released October 1st, 2019. He's a former professional community organizer who ran organizing projects in Massachusetts and Rhode Island in the 1970s. He became a goldsmith and graduate gemologist. I definitely said that right. Gemologist in the 1980s and began traveling internationally and writing about gemstones in 1986. His articles have appeared in Gems and Gem Gemology. I have an English degree and I can't read. Uh, and many other industry publications. He's a former gemology columnist for the National Jeweler and a contributing editor, Gem Market News. He currently writes a book review column for Gemology Today. Please join me in welcoming them both and Salt of the Nation and Red Line to the Strand. Thanks very much. It's uh, good to see all of Matt Bloom's relatives here. <laughs> relatives here tonight. Can you hear me? There we go. Okay, that's that's it. Uh, just to clarify a little bit about redlining, uh, I noticed the ex uh, mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, has has gone on record to talk about redlining in the campaign a little bit, uh, but he got it all wrong. So just to, just to tell you a little bit, redlining is geographic discrimination. It's when banks and insurance companies draw a red line around a neighborhood and refuse to either grant mortgages or insure properties. What happens is dramatic and devastating. The mortgage market collapses. People who have lived in the neighborhood, homeowners who've lived there for years and years, find the, prop the values of their properties, the value that they depended on perhaps for retirement, all of a sudden is worth 20 cents on the dollar. The banks take no responsibility, and uh, within a generation or so, usually the neighborhood is toast. Um, but redlined is not about redlining exactly. Redlined is about a group of neighborhood people who got together and successfully took on the big Boston banks and stopped redlining in uh, the community of Jacob, Jamaica Plain in Boston. So. <coughs> So with that, I'm going to start off with one of the longest run-on sentences in the English language. I was a big fan of Proust. <laughs> <laughs> My editor read the, uh, this uh, sentence, and she said, well, you know, you ain't Proust. Uh, but she decided to leave it in. Chapter 1, The Vigil, February 25th, 1974. Born in the northern Atlantic, the icy wind swept due south past a freighter steaming east out of Argentia, Newfoundland. Veered west, curled around the rock-bound main coast, hummed a tune through the rigging of the Boston lightship, crossed Boston Harbor, swept up the corridor between Columbus Avenue and the Jamaica Way, ruffled the steel gray surface of Jamaica Pond, funneled through the narrow canyon of double-deckers, backed along Jamaica Plains Green Street, 
then cut like a sharpened blade through a down jacket and several layers of wool and sent a shiver tap dancing up the spine of the young neighborhood organizer who stood lonely vigil on a cold winter's night. It was pa past midnight and Sandy Morgan was still alive. She rocked up onto her toes, then stamped her feet. The night was black and bitter as the dregs at the bottom of her cardboard coffee cup. The young woman gazed up at stars shining like tiny pinpricks in a coal black shroud. She crumpled the cup in her hand and started to toss it into the trash strewn alleyway, then hesitated. No, no, mustn't litter, she whispered to herself grinned and stuffed the crushed cardboard deep into the side pocket of her down parka. Very sexy, Sandy. You look like a corn dog wrapped in a blue bun. That was her roommate Sarah's verdict the day she wore the new parka back to the dorm. Didn't Allie McGraw wear something like this in Love Story? Sandy asks, twisting side to side, admiring her new purchase in the full length mirror. Sarah was an Ivy League wannabe, and Allie McGraw was Sarah's role model. She had seen Love Story like a gazillion times. And Sandy had bought the Parker partially in protest against her roommate's stultifyingly conservative style of dress. Yeah, well, she thought, wrapping her arms around her chest and hugging herself close. I'd rather be a warm corn dog than a frozen french fry on a night like this. She leaned back against the door, her eyes closed, her lips curled into a smile as her mind drifted back to a golden August afternoon. For the moment, she forgot the cold, forgot that she should shivering in the cramped shadow of a cellar doorway, guarding one of a serried row of hulking tenements, their darken darkening win darkened windows gazing with sightless eyes over Green Street. Instead, she stood engrossed in the gurgling melody that played against the smooth hull of her catboat, her mind recalling only the warmth of her family's carefree Nantucket summers. She felt herself falling and instinctively reached out and steadied herself against the peeling door frame. Whoa there, Sandy, let's try to stay awake. She stretched her back, then pushed back her sleeve, exposing the glowing dial and sighed, 12.50 a.m., just 10 minutes since the last check. She glimpsed something out of the corner of her eye. Her breath caught. Was that a light in the first floor window? She narrowed her eyes and studied the window. Must be seeing things. She stamped her feet, checked her watch again. Shit. She had been standing in the doorway now for an hour and a half. Easy, Sandy girl, she admired herself, admonished herself. Don't go getting all squirrely on me. Sandy had stopped by the old stone church that served as the project's office just after 10 p.m. to pick up a file. Her meeting with a couple of block club leaders had run late. The ladies had won a commitment from the city to have a neighborhood fire trap boarded up in record time. And the buzz of power was as heady as it was unfamiliar to a pair of working class Boston Irish housewives. She and her boss, Jedediah Flint, had discussed the surveillance and the wisdom of her getting an early start. Does a guy ever sleep or take nourishment, she wondered. Flint sat alone in the project's office, lounging in his swivel chair, feet up on his desk, with a phone cradled in the crook of his hunched left shoulder. A white porcelain coffee mug stood by his right hand. The office was an open plan cube farm. Movable dividers separated into a crossword puzzle of workstations, one for each of the staff organizers. The eight foot fluorescent tubes mounted in the ceiling lit up the interior like a fish market. Flint nodded in recognition, spat a few word, quick words into the black mouthpiece, dropped it into its cradle and swung his feet onto the floor. You're up late, he said. Yeah, the block club victory meeting just ended, she said. Flint looked up and rubbed his chin. How'd it go? Really well, the city is scheduled to board up early next week. 
Armed with Sandy's research and tactical advice, the two ladies had led a charge to secure the abandoned property. It had been a short, tough fight between the neighborhood group and the Boston Building Commissioner. You should have seen the commissioner's face. It was a thing of beauty. He asked to speak with two representatives, then opened his door, and like you suggested, the whole group filed in, kids and all. Pretty big office, but they filled it up like an overstuffed sandwich. Told him they had been complaining for a year and refused to budge. Flint grinned. Then what happened? Well, he got real nervous. Tried the real usual bureaucratic stuff, state regulations, blah, blah, blah. He's running around trying to keep the kids from snatching up the little ornaments from he had all over his desk. So after a year of BS over that fire trap, the people weren't buying it. The man was really shocked when Molly corrected him and quoted the relevant passage in the state sanitary code from memory. They left with a date. Congratulations, he said. Oh, the ladies, they're on a power high. There's a group of neighborhood kids want to build a street hockey rink, uh, and the block club is getting, making plans to help them get it. Sandy stood on her feet apart and her hands on her hips and looked down at Flint. You think anybody's going to try to torch that building before midnight, boss? She asked. He shrugged. It's hard to say. Supposed to be a cold snap all this week, she said. He shrugged. Yeah. It'll be your co cold. It'll be cold. Your call, he said. Yeah, right. She saw right through the feigned indifference. He was being cute, manipulating her, and she resented it. But then what did she expect? Keeping the place from being burned down before the city had a chance to board it up was her problem, and she knew she had to deal with it. She was scared of being out there late at night, but wasn't ready to admit it to herself, and she was never going to admit it to him. She and Flynn had an odd sort of relationship. He's definitely a sexist, she decided. Though at one point, she had fantasized about a night in bed with him. What makes you so sure, Jedediah, about the burning, I mean? His d dark eyes rounded briefly at her use of his first, f full na his first name. He, ha he had a lopsided smile that played off against the sharp angles of his face. He usually called his employers by their last names, and most just called him Jed. He raised his elbows and stretched his long rangy body. Come on, Morgan. You've done the math. Except those properly boarded up, every vacant building within two or three blocks of the corridor has been torched. The question is, who is doing it and why? This one, your club is scheduled for board up, fits the pattern. If memory serves, you are the first one to notice that pattern. Sandy shrugged her heavy bag onto an unoccupied desk and slumped down into the chair. Yeah, even a couple bordering the corridor that were well boarded up were torched. But if there is really a pattern, I don't know, me and my big mouth, too many games of Monopoly when I was a kid, I guess. Flint smiled at her. Yeah, well, nobody else noticed. Shows like you've been shows you've been paying attention. Her eyes looked boldly back at him. The color was arresting, disconcerting. China blue, one of the younger organizers called them. Really? That sounds almost like a compliment, boss. Well, don't let it go to your head, Morgan. There's a lot of homeless types looking for a place to crash. They break in, make fires to keep warm, piss all over the floor, strip out the cop copper to buy booze or drugs, and the fire just gets away from them. Like you said in the staff meeting, lately it's been happening too damn quick, and nobody even bothers with the copper. I'm going to I'm going to shift Sandy Morgan hugged herself to keep warm and waited for the two men to return. She had been fighting a cold all week and could feel the beginnings of a headache. Ten minutes passed. Finally, they reappeared and sauntered out into the side, onto the sidewalk. One was carrying what looked like some sort of a container. 
but the thick shadows made it impossible to make a definite identification. They came from the back of the house, all right. She stared at the front windows, ex expecting at any moment to see the bright licking tongues of flame, but all remained dark. The men crossed the street, walked up to the car and got in. Doors slammed. The car accelerated, and as it passed Sandy's hiding place, the headlights flicked on. Gotcha, she said out loud. She pulled a pencil and notebook out of her pocket and scribbled the license number. The brake lights flashed briefly as the car made a ride onto Center Street, and all was quiet. Nothing stirred. It was as if the night itself held its breath. Okay, half an hour, she whispered, checking her watch. I'll wait. If nothing happens, I'm out of here. Her teeth chattered. The wind cut through the stretched material of her jean-clad legs, and she waited. Am I really cold or just chicken, she asked herself. Fifteen minutes later, she stepped out onto the sidewalk, looked both ways, then darted across the street, jogged down the sidewalk, ducked into the dark corridor alongside the house, and made her way to the back door. The steady pumping of her heart was audible in her ears. The plywood planking that had been nailed across the door frame had been torn off and lay on the ground. The door was ajar. The snowy area around the stoop was a jumble of footprints. She could just make out the dull gleam of the metal fence that separated the backyard from the adjacent property. She took off one glove and reached into her pocket, grasped a handful of keys, and with her fingers picked out the small metal pen light attached to her key ring and pulled the tiny butt, pushed the tiny button. A weak yellow beam flickered, barely penetrating the darkness. Oh shit, not now, she swore. She shook the pen light and the beam brightened. Yes, God, she said, solemnly promising herself to replace the batteries first thing, pushed open the door and stepped into the narrow doorway. It was damp, dank, and smelled of mold. She swung the beam. To her left, she could see the door to the first floor apartment. To the right, a narrow oak wainscoted stairway disappeared upward into the murky darkness leading to the second floor. Sandy twisted the knob of the, on the apartment door and pushed. The door swung inward with a raspy creak. Shit, the fucking house of Usher. Her voice sounded hollow, but reassuring. The raw, cobwebby cellar smell assaulted her nostrils. She shivered. She was out of the wind, but the dank air cut through her jeans, and she could feel it penetrate down to the bone. She gl the room had been entered was the room she had entered, it was obviously the kitchen. She caught a glimpse of a patterned linoleum floor. She pl played the feeble beam of her pen light over the wall. The original Wayne Scotting had been painted over. Battered metal cabinets were bolted to the wall. The cabinet doors gaped open like dark mouths. It looked as if someone had cleaned out the contents and left in a big hurry. God, it's cold, she whispered. Technically, she thought, I'm trespassing. Technically, hell. What do I do if the cops show up? What do I tell them I'm doing in here? She asked, but got no answer. Okay, one quick look-see and I'm gone. Placing one foot carefully in front of the other, she moved towards the half-open right-hand door. She felt something under her foot, but didn't look down. She thought she heard the crunch of breaking glass. She stepped over the threshold and played the thin beam of the light over the walls. The room was small, rectangular, and empty. Sandy took a breath and directed her light downward. She played the light up on the ceiling. There was a large, ragged section of exposed lath. She heard a sharp cracking sound and froze in mid-stride. Probably just a rat. She stood perfectly still. She shuddered, but this time not from the cold. Sandy Morgan hated rats. Dreadful, greasy, nasty things whose sharp, gnawing teeth. I'm gonna skip this too. Sandy tiptoed to the end of the room, flattened her back against the wall next to the paired windows that overlooked the street and held her breath and looked out, empty. 
She exhaled gratefully, turned and tiptoed back the way she had come, turned right and pushed. It was one of those old-fashioned, solid swinging doors that were sometimes used in big houses to divide the dining room for the butler's pantry. It seemed odd to find one in this small apartment. Maybe the house had once been a single family, and this was the door between the kitchen and the dining room. Yeah, that would expa explain it, she thought. The room was considerably larger, but it was not empty. A stack of geometric shapes that might have been furniture had been assembled in the center of the room and covered with some sort of tarp. At the far end of the room, a bay of three tall windows, the shape of a half hexagon, jutted out over the street. She stepped gingerly, skirting the pile, her feet crunching broken glass, and made her window way to the window and looked out. Silent as the grave, she whispered. Oh, shut up, Sandy. She sniffed the air. The same dank, wet, moldy newspaper smell, but different this time, overlaid with a sharper odor. She sniffed again. The acrid smell was very familiar, but she couldn't quite identify it. The pen light flickered, and the room went black. Damn, not now. Just what I don't need, she whined. She shook the pen light, and the light flickered on. She was breathing heavily. Thank you, God. Better get a move on. This light is not going to last much longer. Time to get the fuck out of here. Take a couple of aspirins and get some sleep. I'll call Jed Flint tomorrow. He will no doubt have a few bright ideas. She turned to retrace her steps, and out of the corner of eyes, her eye, she caught the tiny glint of something coming from the center of the pile a little flicker that made her catch her breath. Sandy tiptoed to the edge of the pile. She put her hand on the canvas. Whatever it covered felt solid. She stood up on her toes and leaned forward to look over the top. The sharp smell was much stronger. The canvas was wet and so was her hand. She sniffed at it and this time, even with a stuffed up nose, the odor was unmistakable. Nail polish remover? She asked herself out loud. She, her eye caught the flicker of a light. Suddenly, it was all too clear. She understood why men had come to this vacant building in the small hours of a cold winter night. Oh, my Jesus God. The adrenaline rush hit her like a sledgehammer. She pushed herself upright, sidestepped around the pile, launched herself into the dark rectangle of the doorway. She was terrified, a panicked animal, with only one, one narrow focus, escape. Just for a millisecond, a flicker of regret. I should have snuffed it out. But for Sandy Morgan, that thought arrived just a bit too late. From behind her, a sound erupted like wind rushing through the mouth of a narrow canyon. Sandy felt herself being lifted off her feet and propelled forward like an errant leaf in the wind. Her face smashed into something hard, and the world exploded in blinding light and searing pain. The arsonist had been sloppy. Every room had been thoroughly doused. The hot, rapidly expanded gas, expanding gases pressed the walls of the old house outward. Like a pair of puffed out cheeks, the explosion ripped out the tinder dry walls and shattered the windows into a million shrouds. Like glittering diamonds, they shot, gunned out into the night. It was 12.15 a.m., Sandy Morgan was no longer alive. Thank you. All right, I'll, uh, great. Thank you. I'll get those, no worries, I got them. Okay. I think I'll stand. Um, let me let me move this over here. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and, uh, great. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, 
uh, people often ask me how I got my start uh, writing, and um, it, it all started back in the summer of um, uh, of, of eighty nine, and um, in a little yellow cabin in Montauk, Long Island, um, way out on the end of the way on the on the tip of the island, and. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't really have any idea what to do with my life, um, and I was bartending um, uh, down on the on the beach. And um, it was toward the end of the summer, and one night I couldn't sleep, and uh, all of a sudden it hit me um, like a like a like a bolt of lightning that I, I wanted to be a writer, and and um, and and it's been uh, well. It's been 30 years since then. I've been back to that uh, cabin recently. Um, it's still standing. It's still yellow. Um, I'm still standing, and and, uh, and and I couldn't be happier or more uh, thrilled to be here at you know one of the great bookstores in the world, um, living um, you know another chapter in my dream, which is to uh, you know read from my latest novel. Uh, it's called uh, Salt of the Nation. And um, I'm going to read you a brief synopsis of the book. And the reason I'm going to read it is because I spent so much time honing the synopsis that it, it's actually uh, uh, more coherent than what I could explain. So, And the last time I read from my last book, I didn't need reading glasses, so t time has definitely passed. So Salt of the Nation is the story of an ordinary man on an extraordinary journey, a disillusioned gravel plant worker who impulsively slugs a presidential nominee during a campaign photo op and instantly becomes America's most famous fugitive and newest hero. Harry McBride's vicious punch is caught on camera immediately go goes viral as he flees the scene of his crime and heads for Mexico. While being pursued across the country by a zealous born-again private investigator, Harry is taunted via the airwaves by Grover Budd, a hyperbolic talk show radio host who doggedly portrays Harry as a subversive agent of the Socialist Democratic Party. Salt of the Nation is more than a road story. It's a novel about a land riven by broken promises, thwarted dreams, and populism gone awry. It's the story of a contemporary America equally divided and galvanized by an ordinary man's rash act and desperate journey. So um, I'm going to read t uh, two chapters, two short ones. Uh, total reading time, 17 minutes. So if you get... Uh, anyone who's antsy out there, like, like I tend to be, um, t t um, not to worry. Um, and uh, before I do, I want to thank Adelaide Books for, for publishing Salt of the Nation um, and, and doing such a fine job with it, um, for, for setting up a, a reading at, at uh, The Strand, which is really one of the great bookstores in the world. And I really want to thank all of you for coming. I know there's a, a number of you that have been to other readings of mine, and um, so I really appreciate that you're willing to put yourself through this again. Um, for those that haven't, weren't able to get the, to the other ones, it's great to have you here. Um, so I have some really old friends I haven't seen in a while. Uh, uh, the woman who married Shelly and I is sitting right there. So this is a s truly special night, Vi Higginson. Um, we invited your sister, Vi. I don't, I don't know where she is, but she's on her way from Fort Lee. Um, so um, the first chapter I'm going to read is chapter three. And it's um, the reason I chose it is because it um, it introduces a lot of the major the main characters in the book um, it, for a listener who has not read the book yet it, it gives you an idea of what happened what's going on what might be happening in the future uh, in the book and um, so let me do that let me grab some water and 
you, if you look at the cover here, um, the, the, the story takes place during a 19-day journey from New Jersey down to the border of Mexico. And um, the cover, as you can see, is starts out in Jersey, and it's a fissure going through America. But it's also the it's also the the uh, the route that Harry takes um, in his um, in his journey um, on the run from the law. And the way the book is structured is each chapter has a subtitle which um, tells you where Harry is physically um, in America and what day on the journey he is. So this is chapter three, Warrington, Virginia, day two. Route 17 emerged from murky pre-dawn into Warrington, Virginia's Neon Alley, its dual-sided row of fast food and motels and car dealerships glaring through the windshield. The town seemed like one endless strip to Harry, though no different from the others he'd already driven through that night. He felt bone tired and would have fallen asleep behind the wheel if not for the multicolored lights assaulting his eyes and the pain dogging his hand and back. A red and white Arby's reminded him of the hero sandwich he'd made that morning, so long ago it seemed. An inch of roast beef topped with iceberg lettuce, ripe Jersey tomato, red onion, and homemade Russian dressing. Yet instead of eating it, he'd spent his lunch break waiting to shake Senator Landon's hand for the cameras after listening to him spout phony populism for what seemed like hours. He monitored an oncoming state trooper until the cruiser passed and disappeared from the rear view. He tapped the brakes as he approached a, a Burger King but defied his sharpening hunger and kept going, intent on adding miles while minimizing human contact. Which is, that is, which is exactly what he'd done after slugging Senator Land and instinctively ducking beneath the closest Secret Service agent's tackle, causing the agent to collide with the one who'd lunged at him from the other side. Both agents had fallen and three more had tripped over them in a futile effort to grab Harry. Heavy steel-toed boots had slowed Harry's flight, but not enough to prevent him from escaping into the maze of crushers and storage bins and gravel chutes beyond the loading dock's metal doors. The massive equipment had provided the cover he'd needed to slip unseen out, unseen out the side exit few knew about, then slink across the narrow parking lot into the swamp only mosquitoes and frogs and a family of muskrats called home. The fuel gauge of the Taurus he'd stolen from a back street several blocks from Sergeant Hubbard near empty, forcing him to stop at an Exxon on the far side of Warrington. He pumped gas with his Yankee cap pulled low and paid for it with some of the $400 he'd managed to withdraw from an ATM on his way out of Hackettstown. He continued south after filling up the tuner scanning songs he'd never heard and some he'd heard thousands of times. It paused on mattress and insurance and beer commercials, and on DJs it all sounded the same. It soon landed on one who didn't. Thanks for your call, Kevin from Kentucky, KK for short. If Kevin here happens to hail from Keaton, Kentucky, Grover Bud might just have another run in with the almighty PC police. But seriously, KK, you and everyone else have so far failed to address and answer the burning question of the day, which is where the hell is Harry McBride? Harry froze the tuner on the Grover Bud Show rerun. Where exactly is that bearded bastard who slugged Senator Landon? Hey, Harry, where are you? Better yet, who are you and what are you and how much are you paying Barry Schwartz? Or maybe it's the Democrat Party paying you. Harry cleared Warrington and turned onto an unlit, unmarked road three miles beyond the town line. He pulled over after rounding a bend and got out with the scissors and an electric razor he'd bought at a Walgreens in Chester, Pennsylvania. He'd also purchased a map, two long sleeve shirts, water, bread, and peanut butter. He would have bought more but feared the night clerk might remember a man stocking fugitive supplies. Thorns and prickers grabbed at his green dickies as he bushwhacked through a tangle of shrubs and a stand of weed trees. He began to scissor his hair and beard in a clearing beyond them. Clumps fell to the ground and scattered like pine needles around his boots still dusted with pulverized New Jersey bluestone. He ran the electric razor over his scalp and cheeks next and returned to the car as smooth-faced and bald as an infant. 
He looked in the rear view, and his newly exposed lips made him feel somewhat vulnerable, although he felt pleased the jaw he hadn't seen in years still appeared chiseled. He started the engine, and Grover Bud flowed back into the car. That a nobody like Harry McBride can just punch a U.S. senator is a sure sign this country's going to hell in a handbasket. Harry pushed scan once he got back onto Route 17. The tuner abandoned Bud in favor of rainy days and Mondays by the Carpenters. The glum melody and depressing lyrics compelling Harry to push scan again. The tuner ran right back to Bud. I'm talking to you, McBride. Turn yourself in and face the music. Harry hesitated before pulling his phone from his pocket and dialing with his thumb. Harry, it's me. You're not supposed to be calling. You got to listen to this crap, Grace. Harry held the phone to the dashboard speaker so his ex-wife could hear Bud. Barry Schwartz and his Socialist Democrat Party are using Harry McBride, and I'm sure they'll use others just like him so they can start a class war for the purpose of taking wealth from those who create it and redistributing it to those who don't create a damn thing. Harry brought the phone to his mouth. You hear what this prick's saying? Oh, don't listen to him. There's nothing else on. Then turn off the radio. It helps me stay awake. You shouldn't be driving tired. How's your back? Barking like a dog. You got your Percocet? Percocet don't work no more. Well, don't drink. I only had two beers. A pause on the other end. I know I shouldn't ask, but where the hell are you going? Mexico. That's ridiculous. They said the same thing about putting a man on the moon. The scientists didn't go punch a senator in the face. Oh, he deserved it. Grace yawned into the phone. Whatever you say, I got to go back to sleep. One of the other nurses is sick, so I got early shift tomorrow. How are your patients doing? Most cancer patients die. I don't know how you do it, Grace. You better turn yourself in, Harry. You're already in a shitload. I know, I know. Do it, and don't do nothing stupid in the meantime. Stupid? Me? Just be careful. Grace hung up, and Harry shut off the phone to save battery. This is interesting, Bud said. The footage of McBride reveals a Pegasus tattoo on his right forearm, one of those flying horses. But get this, Harry McBride's not only, Pegasus not only has wings, it also has a horn protruding from his forehead. Seems the man's gotten his Greek mythological creatures mixed up, which suggests he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Harry turned off the radio and took the next exit off Route 17. He followed smaller state and county roads from there, fewer lights and cars the further south and west he went. A billboard advertising a gift shop in Johnsonboro, Virginia, inspired him to pull over and retrieve a pen from the glove compartment. He used it to write on the napkin he'd taken from the Golden Bell Diner, pressing gently to keep from pushing through. You gave me everything, Grace, but I was blind to your gift. Now I'm on the road with nothing, only your sweet voice giving me wisdom before your early morning shift. He folded the napkin, closed his eyes, and imagined writing more poetry in Mexico, maybe even short stories. He pictured the sun-drenched seaside village he'd live in and the baby he and Grace might have if he could convince her to join him and that things would be different. No miscarriages down there, none of the other problems either. He imagined starting over and leaving his troubled past north of the border. An 18-wheeler zoomed by, pushing a wall of air that rocked the tourists. Harry opened his eyes and steered back onto the highway, connecting him to every other in America. He tried to maintain his Mexican dream as he hit the gas, but the dream began to fade as he gained speed toward it, slipping like sand through his damaged fingers until only the ache remained. Um. So that's chapter three. Um, the, the next chapter I'm going to read is chapter 18. Um, and um, to preface it, it uh, the, in the preceding chapter, in chapter 17, Harry's been l running low of funds, and he's in, driving across the panhandle of Texas at this point. He spots a billboard, or several billboards, advertising um, a steak eating contest at a restaurant called Big Steak. And he, um, if you eat a, uh, a five-pound steak, a baked potato, a shrimp salad, a regular salad, and drink a giant Coke, uh, all within an hour, up on a stage, um, you you win $500. So he, you know, he's also a bit of a foodie, so he, he can't resist. Um, 
but and during the course of this steak eating contest, which he he, he succeeds at, um, he slowly gets recognized by the. It's a giant restaurant, it's like a size of a football field, so people start to recognize him, and he, bec- you know, they're all chanting his name, and everyone loves him at this point. Um, but afterwards, he has nowhere to go, so the um, hostess um, invites him back to her um, sing- her her trailer where she lives nearby. Chapter 18, Will Dorado, Texas, day 16. Mary held her index finger to her lips and whispered, he's a light sleeper, before leading Harry into her mobile home and directing him to sit on a built-in couch padded by worn cushions. She went into the bedroom, and Harry heard her cooing through the thin door as he assessed the trailer, everything in it slightly miniaturized. Mary returned minutes later, her big steak uniform exchanged for white sweatpants and a pink t-shirt. An elastic now gathered her hair into a ponytail. Your son stay here all alone, Harry said. My mom comes most nights. I'm a nervous wreck till I get home when she can't. What about a babysitter? Sitters cost money. Harry noticed a studio photo of a tow-haired infant on the wall. The only other decoration other than a dime store mirror and an out-of-date puppy calendar beside the refrigerator. Cute kid. Mary smiled at the photo. He's a good boy. She looked from the photo to Harry, her smile melting away. I'd offer you something, but you probably had enough for tonight. Don't think I'll be eating for a week, Harry said. Mary filled a mug with water at the kitchen sink and brought it to her guest. What's your story, Harry? Oh, I'm sure you already know it. Only what's in the news. There's not much else. I don't believe that. Uh, I wouldn't want to bore you. How could being Harry McBride be boring? Harry would have laughed if not for Mary's earnest expression and equally earnest tone. It's real boring, believe me. Harry sat bes- uh, Mary sat beside him and gestured to the cramped interior. I'm a single mom living in a single trailer. Now that's boring. How old's your kid? Just turned four. You have any? No. Mary's eyes flitted over Harry's bare ring finger. A wife? Not anymore. Looks like you're free as a bird. My cage is just a little bigger than most people's right now. Mary scrutinized her own cage as if searching for an escape. What's it like on the run? Tired, nerve-wracking. I don't recommend it. People would have turned you in by now if they weren't on your side. You saw that earlier. Harry fingered the ridge in his pocket created by his big stake winnings. They think I'm some kind of rock star. Maybe they're living through you in a weird way, Mary said. Harry thought of the miles of Texas still separating him from Mexico. They wouldn't want to live through me if I get caught and go to jail. A pause in the conversation gave Harry time to wonder if Mary wanted something from him. I said you could stay here tonight, but I need a favor in return, Mary said, answering the unasked question. What kind of favor? I want you to put your hand on my son. My hand on your son? On his head. Uh, Why do you want me to do that? For good luck. Harry noticed Mary's earnestness had returned. You must be watching too many of those faith healer shows they got down here. Oh, I don't believe in that stuff, Mary said. Well, what do you think I can... I believe in you, though. I'm not sure why. Harry noticed his ghostly image reflected by the early morning darkness on the other side of the small window. I'm just a gravel worker from Hackettstown, New Jersey, he said, weariness seeping from his muscles into his bones. Please, Harry. Harry wished he hadn't heard the pleading in her voice. He looked at his hands and wondered what they could possibly do for a child, especially one he'd never met. Uh, All right, if that's what you want. Mary stood and took Harry into the bedroom. His eyes soon adjusted enough to discern a rumpled duvet draped over a doll-like figure sleeping on a low-slung couch. Cot. Mary motioned Harry toward the cot, which squeaked and bowed when he sat on its edge. Rest your hand on his head, she whispered, the one you punched the senator with. Harry hesitated before cupping his right hand over the boy's forehead. It fit into his palm as snugly as a softball, its warmth easing some of the persistent pain. 
the boy stirred and Harry smiled down at him, his first smile since Hackettstown. Mary left the room and time seemed to pass quickly yet slowly from then on. Harry remained on the cot, his hand melded to the child's head while minutes gathered into and beyond an hour, and the blackness enveloping the trailer gradually gave way to tentative light. Harry soon felt untethered from time and place, from past and future, unchained thoughts and emotions roaming freely in a heightened present. He made no effort to contain them as they transformed Mary's son into the one he and Grace might have had. They roamed even further until an unexpected love for the sleeping child rose from deep within, powerfully enough to scare him a little. The youngster opened his eyes just before dawn, neither surprised nor alarmed to find Harry there. Ma's going to buy me an Xbox when I'm five, he said in a small, croaky voice. Harry had heard of Xbox. Xbox, huh? That, that, that's good. Are you going to be my daddy? Your daddy? Uh, no, no, I'm just, uh, I'm just a friend. That mean you'll stay with us? Harry searched for the right words, careful not to choose any that might disappoint the little guy. I'll do my best, was all he could find. The boy's eyes closed again, and his breathing soon reclaimed a sleep rhythm. Harry looked out the window at the graying sky and knew he should go before it filled with light and the, and the roads filled with cars and watchful eyes. He removed his hand from the boy and kissed his cheek, then left the bedroom and found Mary asleep on the couch. He bent down and kissed her cheek too, lightly so she wouldn't wake. He snuck through the kitchen and out into the cool semi-desert. He quietly moved away from the trailer but stopped after only a few yards and stood as still as the cacti growing from sun-baked ground that felt like concrete through his worn soles. A swallow whistled, the only sound other than Harry's own breathing. He listened to both while fighting the urge to go back inside and somehow save Mary and her son from their difficult, uncertain lives. Because he knew damn well he couldn't save them from anything and probably would only make things matters worse if he tried. So he took from his pocket the cash he'd won at Big Stake and returned to the trailer. Yet instead of opening and stepping through the door, he slipped the money beneath it, then forced himself to turn and walk away, his heart as heavy as his stomach, his tired eyes searching for a car to steal. And that's uh, just a sample of Salt of the Nation. Thank you. So really quick, I'll just turn it off, it's okay. Hi guys. So really quick, we have about 10 minutes for questions. They are going to choose. You guys are gonna raise your hands. You're going to wait till I come around with the mic because we are recording and it's weird on a video if there's dead silence and then an answer. So anybody have any questions? Yeah, I, I mean, I assume based on the sign back there that both of, both of these books are classified as erotica, and I, I wondered if you, I wonder if you guys were just too chicken to read those chapters. My wife made me leave my uh, leather teddy at home, so I. Yeah, I was happy when I saw that. I figured that that's probably the only reason anyone showed up. <laughs> Should result in a few sales. <laughs> Any more questions? Cool. More? I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about each of you about your work in progress, if you have any. Well, I'm currently uh, working on a book uh, set 35,000 years ago. Um, we don't know about much with, w about what was going on back there, so nobody can call me a liar. Um, it's a prehistorical novel. Um, I'm working on a, on a few projects. Um, I have some children's books that um, my uh, series called "The Hello, My Name Is Bunny," and I just I finished the third installment. Um, 
And I have another novel called Cat Dancer that I'm going to be getting back to soon. In the meantime, I'm actually, though, um, rewriting my first novel, um, which is called Blue Paradise. I've changed the title, and I'm, I'm just, I went, I just figure I can improve it greatly, and I'm hoping it has a second life. So uh, that, that's what I'm really working on now, and hope to have it done in a few months. Uh, for Mr. Bloom, it sounds like there's a political component to your a strong political component of the political divide in the country in your book. Was that uh, something that you got inspiration from what's going on in the real world, or this was a, a book long in coming and it just happens to collide well with the the strong political division in the country right now? Um, yeah, that's it's funny because it, it, now it seems to um, kind of hit at, a, at 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 the right time. Uh, but I did come up, I came up with the, the, the kernel of the idea, like, m you know, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, I was at a, uh, was, um, like a black tie cocktail party. I was a, a plus, I don't know what I was doing there, and I can't remember. But uh, I looked across the room, and I saw a very well-known statesman and uh, who was very controversial. And I, I, um, I said, gee, I, to myself, I said, you just walk right over and punch that guy out, and no one could stop me. <laughs> so... Uh, but um, I didn't, and uh, so, but year, several years after that, I was thinking about that. I said, well, God, what would happen if someone actually did that, um, and, and what would be the aftermath? And so within about an hour, I had the whole basic story for this. Um, but I started writing this in a, um, so I, I've written on and off. I wrote, I wrote for maybe, uh, I started like in 2013 or something, and, and then I, I put it down for several years and, um, and then took it up again. But now it seems to have, the right, the, the right time has come for it because the country is quite divided. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Not a very good one. <laughs> Any more questions? Going once, going twice, going two and a half, anybody? All right. Well, then on that note, let us both all give a round of applause to our two authors.